Civic Center, right, in Statesville. Uh, I, I mentioned something that I hope you will uh, understand. There are a lot of people who don't know the Lord who quite honestly are scared to come to a church building. Uh, they, it's sort of threatening, and maybe they're from another denomination, and they were told, uh, you, don't you dare go into that other church. But when you come to a neutral place like a civic center, uh, it just sort of breaks down barriers. And I have found it's a great opportunity to invite a friend, a neighbor, uh, someone you know that needs the Lord or needs a church home. Now, last week we talked about being transformed by the renewing of our minds to know the will of God. And it's so important because all of us have decisions that we make. We are constantly being squeezed by the world. Uh, the Phillips translation, remember, do not be conformed. In other words, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. So I want to continue tonight on the transformation, and particularly it occurs through the Word of God. And I want to share with you about you, uh, how the Word of God will guide us in the Lord's direction. We're praying for the pastor search team. We're asking God to speak to them, reveal Himself to them. But it's at the same time that we all need to be directed by the Lord. So I want you to take your Bible and turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, once again. Romans 12, 1 and 2. And then we're going to look in Psalm 119, 105. Uh, I, we're going to be turning a lot in the Scripture tonight to various parts of the Scriptures. It's important, I, I believe, that you take notes. I don't know how many of you are used to taking notes on a message. Yes, sir, God bless you. Great is your reward in heaven. Because, honestly, most of us have trouble remembering something a day or two later. But when you take notes, particularly when the pastor gives you Scripture references and principles, it really, really helps to have written it down. Now, let's, let's look at the Word. By the way, before we do that, remember that it's easy for us to get wrong messages. Every preacher struggles with the fact that when he gets up and speaks, people may not understand what he's trying to say. They may interpret something. Things get lost in translation. Do you remember Braniff Airlines? Braniff Airlines. Uh, they... Uh, one time were promoting a new form of leather seat in their airline. And they wanted to target Spanish-speaking folks in Miami, Florida. And so they, they, I don't think a uh, Hispanic person was helping in them with this, but they gave their message, their big promotion of their leather seats said, Sentado in Cuero. Sentado in cuero. Cuero also can mean not only uh, seat, but it can mean bare skin. And so people, there were some people who thought they were saying, sit bare naked in our airline. <laughs> uh, Chevy Nova, again, trying to communicate in another language. Hispanics uh, not all, of course, but some heard the idea of Nova or Nova. Instead of a car, it was the idea of it doesn't run. No, va. Lost in translation. Here's one more. Uh, President Jimmy Carter. I had an opportunity to meet him in a Wendy's. That's a whole other story. I'll tell you that another time. But President Jimmy Carter went over to Poland, and he tried to speak in the Polish language to the people in Poland. And in this particular speech, he was trying to say that he loved Poles deeply, 
but instead he used the word, instead of deeply, he used the word for erotic sexual love. Not a good idea. Well, we don't want to lose what God is saying to us. God has spoken clearly. He has not stuttered. He has not uh, forgotten anything. But we, our problem is we can miss it, and it can get lost in translation. So let's stand to honor the reading of God's Word once again. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul said, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. To know the will of God, our minds must be transformed. And not only transformed because of what the Lord Jesus does, but in an ongoing way, we are letting the Word of God shape us. Now, would you turn very quickly back to the Psalms? Psalm 119. You know, Psalm 119 is that great psalm that talks about the Word of God. And one of the best exercises you'll ever do in Scripture study is to go through Psalm 119 and list all of the things that the Word of God can do for you. But I want you to look at verse 105, Psalm 119, 105. How many of you memorized this in vacation Bible school or Sunday school? All right. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Grant, we've sung it. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. God will through his word, show us the steps that he wants us to take. You may be seated. Thank you so much. The most tre precious treasure in the world is not the Hope Diamond or the Mona Lisa. It is the Bible. What you and I hold in our hands is the most precious treasure that we can ever look at. Sweat, sto sweat stained by translators, scholars, and blood stained by martyrs. People who have died for the Word of God. And so often we take for granted that this Bible can lead us in the right way. That it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. There was an old farmer and uh, uh, he was trying to witness to an atheist, and the atheist kept telling him that he, uh, he had too simple of a faith. He said, as a matter of fact, you, you have that Bible, and it's full of errors and contradictions. That's what they usually like to say. And then when you tell them, well, which are they, they can't tell you. But uh, he, he went on and on attacking the Bible, and finally the old farmer who had not gotten out of eighth grade finally said, well, I'll tell you one thing. This book of mine speaks to me. It speaks to me. And when you read the Bible, it speaks. God invariably shines that light and that lamp. Now, I want to talk to you about how God transforms us by the renewing of our mind with the Word of God. The Word needs to be magnified. Look again in Psalm 119 at verse 89. Verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. There are those today in our culture that say that it was good for those days, but not for now. Uh, it may have meant this in Paul's day or Moses' day, but it doesn't mean that now. No, the forever God's Word is true and settled. And we don't have any latter-day revelation. Thank you, Mormons. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Uh, God's Word is settled. Now look with me in 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's go all the way over to the New Testament. 
Again, many of you memorized this in Sunday school or VBS, and it's so significant. There's been a battle for the Bible over the last 40 years. And in the Southern Baptist Convention, the, the very uh, point of attack by liberals and radicals was the inerrancy of the Scripture. The Bible is all inerrant, infallible, inspired, and authoritative. And Paul said this, all Scripture is inspired by God. That is, God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I grew up as a teenager in Arizona, uh, early years as well, finally in college, and not until I was 18 did I sit under the preaching of a pastor who went verse by verse. Uh, I, good communicators, good speakers, people who love their flocks, but I did not grow up hearing the, the in-depth teaching of the Word of God. And all over the country right now, there are churches that there, where there is a famine for hearing the Word of God, as, I, as Amos said. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And every bit of it is a blessing to us in one way or another. Now, Jesus knew the importance of the Scripture. Look with me now. Let's turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4. Remember when Jesus began his ministry, he went back to his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, if you ever saw the movie The Passion of the Christ that Mel Gibson put together, that was an astounding uh, attempt to really uh, allow us to see all that Christ went through. If you remember that, he had Aramaic subtitles. Uh, the, uh, they ha he had the actors speaking in Aramaic, and uh, Jesus referred to, we would say Nazareth, but in the Aram they, they had this sense uh, through scholarly interpretation that it would be pronounced Nazareth, Nazareth. And so Jesus went to Nazareth, to the synagogue, and here's what happened. He read the Word of God from Isaiah. Now, I want you to pick up for a moment in verse 15. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, or Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah, by the way, he stood up to read. Did you get that? And so when I have you stand to honor the reading of the Word, it's like the Jews did and like Jesus practiced. As his custom, he did it every time, every time they gathered to read the Word. He entered the synagogue and on the Sabbath had stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah, my English friend said Isaiah, was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and, and so forth. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Uh, this morning I read from the New King James Version. Uh, my favorite translations are New American Standard, which is the most literal, and then... Uh, uh, the King J New King James is a very good translation, and the English Standard Version, ESV, is a tremendous translation. So I, I would say uh, I'm not against the King James, the old King James Version. It's just that some of it is so hard to read and understand because of the language. Uh, I don't have it in my study here, but I actually have three copies of pages from the 1611 and 1613 uh, King James Version. Uh, they were given to me. And uh, these actual pages that were printed in 1611, you would not be able to understand many of the words. So 
What we want to do is have a translation that we can understand, that can be uh, that where the gospel is made clear. So Jesus, and, I, and I'm just a, that's just in parenthesis here, so you wondered what translation I was in. I want you to notice that Jesus saw how important the Word of God was that He began His ministry by reading the Old Testament, reading from Isaiah. He then taught from Isaiah. He then applied the Scripture from Isaiah to Himself and said, Now this is fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he announced the beginning of his ministry. If the Word was that important to Jesus, it certainly be, should be for us. So when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what did he do? What was the sword of the Spirit? How did he counter the devil? He went back to the Word of God. Right? How many times did he quote the Scripture? Can anybody tell me? Three times. It is written, Jesus said. And what book did he quote from? Anybody know? Same book each time. Deuteronomy. How many of you just love Deuteronomy? Never mind, don't answer that. <laughs> Jesus quoted from, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to a test. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of of God. So Jesus was affirming the authority, the inspiration, the inerrancy, and the uh, application of the Word of God. Now, if it's all inspired by God, the Word of God is important to transform us in godliness. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, You've got to know Jesus as the author of the book. Not until the author comes to live in us are we really able to understand the Scripture. I remember, uh, I, I just loved Billy Graham. I think most of us did and do. And uh, I, I was able one, at one point in my early ministry to sit on the platform of a crusade and lead in prayer. And I got to talk to and meet uh, Billy Graham prior to that time. Uh, I sat on the platform between Franklin Graham and Amy Grant, the singer. And so Amy Grant, Grant, Grant uh, a a Amy and I shared a songbook. So I sang with Amy Grant. Okay, well anyway. <laughs> my claim to fame. Well anyway, uh, I got to tell Billy Graham himself my testimony. I was an unsaved middle schooler, and my best friend wanted to go hear Billy Graham. He was a Presbyterian, and I thought he really needs this because he's a Presbyterian. And so I went to the crusade, and uh, he, in the invitation to come down onto the football field, my friend Don said, I need to go. I need you to go with me. And so I went down on the field with Don Miller, and the counselor came to me first. He, the Holy Spirit, I think, had told him, this is the guy that needs it the most. And I said, oh, no, I just brought my friend. And so I went another few years without knowing Christ as my Lord and Savior. And no one shared the gospel with me. And so I, I got to tell uh, Mr. Graham that uh, at the set, though I was not led to Christ at that time, the fact that he would say again and again, the Bible says, the Bible says, made me want to read the Bible, and I tried to read the Scripture. And so at random, I just picked the book of James. And as a young teenager, by this time, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older, and I thought, you know, if Billy Graham said the Bible says, maybe, this is a cool book, it's five chapters. And I don't want to read some book with 20 chapters. So I just picked at random the book of James, and uh, it all sounded good, but it didn't speak to me. It didn't really make sense. Now, if you know the Bible, you know uh, James, it's one of the most basic books in all of the Bible.
It's about good works. And if you can't understand James, you're dead. And I was dead in trespasses in sin. It didn't mean anything to me until the author of the book, Christ, came into my heart and saved me. And what happened is what happened to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Look at Luke 24. Luke 24. They, they were partial disciples. Uh, they were like Old Testament disciples. They, they believed in Jesus, but then their hopes had been dashed by His death on the cross. And as they're walking back home, going back from Jerusalem to Emmaus, Jesus suddenly joins with them. And look what happens here. He asked them, why are you troubled, in verse 38, and, and uh, uh, you know, what's going on? Why, why are you so upset? Uh, and they told him uh, that uh, about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word in the sight of God and all the people, verse 19. He was crucified, and there's no hope. What does Jesus do? I love this. <laughs> verse 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the Scriptures. Isn't that something? Jesus in Deuteronomy. Jesus in Genesis. Jesus in the Psalms. Jesus in Isaiah. All the Scriptures. He explained. What a master teacher. Wouldn't you love to have been in that lecture? As Jesus explained, this is what Isaiah 53 is all about. I have fulfilled that as the suffering servant. And then here's what they said later. They told uh, in verse 32, Were not our hearts burning within us while He was speaking to us on the road, while He was explaining the Scriptures to us? So that's what you have to do. First of all, You've got to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Have the author living in you. And then the second thing is you, you have to ask God to help you to see life and decisions from His perspective. Now that's crucial. That's where uh, presenting your body as a living sacrifice is, which includes your mind. I want the mind of Christ, Lord. I want to see the world through your lens. Now, let me give you a couple of examples because what happens is as we are conformed to the world, if we're not careful, we begin to think exactly like the world and not with the mind and wisdom and perspective of Christ. For instance, in the environment, ecology, Oh, all these people, the, we're, we're going to destroy the world by our uh, emissions and our this and our that. And we're going to, uh, you know, humanity is going to end. It's the whole agenda of the liberal left. And part of it is the worship of Mother Earth. It's really a, a particular cultic religion. But if you put that aside, it's the idea that somehow... We determine the destiny of the planet. But the Scripture says that God is going to allow this place to go on, and when He says it's quitting time, that's when things quit. And if you look in 2 Peter, he talks about how all will eventually be consumed, but only in God's time. A new heaven, a new earth. Not when we destroy it, but when God says, I'm finished with my plan for the planet. We have to have the mind of Christ in His perspective. Because the Word of God helps us, it discerns and helps us judge. Mark Twain once said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand that bother me. In other words, we are convicted of our sin, our selfishness, our poor worldview, and everything else. Now, here's my next point. If we magnify the Word as significant to transform us for godliness, 
then we need ha- the Word to transform us in guidance. And I want to share with you several basic principles. Number one, you read the Bible and you learn to meditate on the Scriptures. Now, I'm not talking about some new agey uh, kind of uh, mantra saying, um, and you're letting your mind go blank. Meditation is really important. Let's, what is that? Well, uh, if you would turn once again to Psalm 119, let me show you a few things. In Psalm 119, 97, the psalmist said, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, the, medita- the word meditation in the Old Testament had two different meanings, at least two. One was the idea of a cow chewing her cud. And she swallows it and brings it back up again. I'm sorry to be gross. And so we chew on the Word. We, uh, we think through the, the Scripture. And then another meaning is sort of a humming of a song. You hear a song, I'm, I'm here, I hear Grant and the the choir, and I, I just find myself singing, uh, you know, just sort of, uh, 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 you know, and, and you, you, it's sort of not really full bore, but it's, it's in your mind. And so meditation is thinking through and praying through the Scriptures. I want to give you a, a life-changing pattern to meditate on the Scripture. Are you ready? You with me? You're going to write this down? But your memory's so good you're going to remember it anyway, right? Okay, I want you to think of the word species. And we're going to do an acrostic. If uh, I didn't have uh, PowerPoint available this week or I'd have it on the screen. But S-P-E-C-I-E-S. Species. You know, we're born again as new creatures in Christ. We are a new species. But anyway, S, P, uh, each of these letters stands for what you can do in meditation. Now let me say that when you're reading the Scripture, you're not going to see this in every verse of the passage. I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of what I'm talking about. But S stands for a sin to confess. You're reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, either it mentions a specific sin or the Holy Spirit puts His finger on a particular sin for you that you must confess. P, in species, a promise to claim. It's like it, God has your name on it. You claim it. E, an example to follow. An example to follow. C, a command to obey. I, I'm going to come back. I'm coming back. Don't worry. I'm a teacher here. I'm going to come back to it. I, an idea about God. In other words, uh, you're learning something about the Trinity or a principle that God has given, or something about His nature, I, an idea about God. E, an error to avoid. S, now when I say an error to avoid, uh, it, there's a difference between an example to follow and an error to avoid. An error is where in the Scripture you see something, say, I, I, I don't want to be proud and bitter like King Saul. I want to praise God like David. You see? So you got an example in David and an error in the things Saul did. And then lastly, a soul to pray for. Somebody jumps out at you as you're reading the Scripture. Uh, It doesn't mean that uh, John Doe's name is in Philippians. But you're reading and uh, uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to you to pray for this man. Now, I, I have found that if you have this in your mind, and, and, and you, the more you do this, the more it will become 
ingrained in you. You don't, you don't just read the Bible for facts and information. What you're doing is praying the Scripture back to God. And the more God speaks to you in a very concrete way, the more your mind is renewed and you're transformed. Now let me give you an example. Let's look at it in the Bible. I want you to turn to Philippians 4 in the New Testament. Philippians 4, verses 10 to 23. Philippians 4, 10 to 23. Now, I'm going to show you, I'm not going to read this whole passage, but I'm going to show you some examples of species. Let me go over it again. A sin to confess, a promise to claim, that's P, E, an example to follow, C, a command to obey, I, an idea about God, E, an error to avoid, S, a soul to pray for. Now, just for your benefit, I wrote down in, this is one of my study Bibles, Look at verse 10. There is an example here as Paul thanks them for their concern for him and how they uh, met his needs. In verse 13, there is a promise to claim. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's one of our favorites. A promise. In E, there's an error to avoid. Uh, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. In other words, uh, boy, I don't, want, I don't want to be siloed like that church. I don't want to be so uh, focused that I can't see in flexibility some other need that I can meet in the kingdom. Here's a great idea about God, verse 20. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That ought to just lead you into a a doxology of praise as you praise and think about the Lord. And then here's a command to obey. Verse 21, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. So that could also be a soul to pray for. And you're reading that, and uh, maybe it's in your, your uh, daily reading, and you come to that, and you think, oh, my goodness, I met so-and-so, I need to pray for them. I don't know. God brought them in my mind. I need to pray for them. Uh, Friday, I had a chance. Janet and I went down to Ballantyne in South Charlotte. You all know who, where that is? And uh, I, each day, one of my prayers is, Lord, I'm available. Who do you want me to speak to about Christ? Who, who, who do you want to put in my path today? I'm available. So uh, Janet was going to go to the Christmas fair in Concord with Allison and the babies. And then I was going to play golf with some, some of our friends from Naples who have moved up to that area at the Ballantine Golf Club. And, uh, you know, I thought I was going to ride with my Baptist friend uh, who, who owns a company and lives up there. And, I, and we had lunch, and I'm thinking, that's, you know, I'm going to be with somebody I know. All of a sudden, he tells me, uh, you're with Dr. So-and-so, who is from India. He's an Indian oncologist, a Hindu. And I'm thinking, oh, boy. Golf with a Hindu doctor. This should be interesting. And we had a wonderful time. And, uh, and when I said, Lord, I'm available, I didn't even imagine that it would be uh, an open door with a Hindu doctor from India. Now, I've been praying for him. He's a wonderful, nice man. But do you see what I'm saying here about the Scriptures? How the Scripture speaks to you? And as you are reading the Word on a daily basis, 
He will illumine a passage with understanding by the Holy Spirit. He will put His finger on an issue in your life and either convict you of sin or command you to do something or encourage you with a promise, but He makes it practical and personal. He will bring insights back to your mind that you've learned on other occasions, but you'll read that word and it'll trigger other things that you know. And as you're praying over a particular decision in the will of God, God will use His Word in guidance. Now let me, let me key in on what that means. And how do you do that? How, how do you allow the Word to guide you and transform you in your decisions. It's particularly important that you and I read the Bible sequentially. That we read, for instance, I'm looking here in the Psalms. That I read Psalm 143 today, and then Psalm 144 tomorrow. Or I read uh, several Psalms today. In other words, you're reading through the Scripture. Uh, you don't want to just pick and choose here and there and uh, just open your Bible and say, all right, this is what I... You, I'm, God speaks to you like that. But you've got to be careful with that when it's a non-orderly, non-systematized study. Uh, there's a famous story about a guy who was just flipping through the Scripture and he put his finger down, you know, he had his eyes closed and he put his finger down, opened the Bible, and the verse said, Judas went out and hung himself. He said, oh, no, no, that's not, I, that's not from God. I, that's, not, that's not for me. So, you know, he closed his eyes again. He flipped his Bible, opened his, put his finger down, and he landed on the verse, go thou and do likewise. Okay. <laughs> okay, it doesn't work. It's not of God. But there are times when God will sovereignly speak to you in a verse in a way that you never imagined. I was, I was reading through uh, the Psalms one day, and I was, really, I was out in New Mexico in a church and praying, Lord, what is your will? And uh, suddenly I came to this verse that said, He freed my hands, or, uh, from, from, uh, freed my shoulders from, from the basket, from carrying the basket. And it was like the Lord said, you can now turn over the church to me. I'll take care of it. Another time I was going through some real trials and in another, in another situation, uh, some people who really were uh, mad at me. And uh, I read the scripture that day, the prudent man sees evil and hides himself out of Proverbs. And God said, you need prudence. You need to, don't just walk into the traps they're laying for you. Do you see what I'm saying here? So what God does, He will speak to you through a very specific principle, command, promise, or whatever. But He will also, in the atmosphere of the Word, create a climate where you are breathing in and breathing out the mind of Christ. And you're beginning to think transformed. In other words, you, you're not thinking just like the world anymore. You're, you're thinking with God's perspective on things. And it's in that, that, con that continual reading and praying and meditating that God begins to speak to you in His Word. Now you're clean by my words, which I've spoken to you, said Jesus. The unfolding of your words gives light, Psalm 119 says. If you read all through Psalm 119, it's just constantly, Revive me, O Lord, according to your word, verse 107. You are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Sustain me according to your word that I may live. All throughout the uh, the Bible, it refers to how God ministers to us. Now, and I'm going to wrap this up. You don't get a word 
from the Word for every decision. That would be boxing God in, in a way, not even with the Bible should you do that. But there are times when you will get a word from God and you know this is not just the Scripture, not just propositional truth. This has my name written on it. Have you had that experience? It only happens when you're reading the Word daily. And God is creating that spiritual atmosphere that transforms your thinking. And then you can claim His promises, and you can say, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Let's bow our heads for a moment. As we listen to the Lord, what is He saying? What's He saying to you? I've tried to be very practical here today. And before we do any kind of an invitation, I want you to let God speak to you. There may be a verse that I've read today or a verse you saw in the Scripture. And God is really drilling in and saying, this is for me. I want us just to be still before the Lord and let Him speak and say, we will say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So I, we're going to be quiet. I'm going to shut up here. Let His Word speak to you. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Now, Lord, whoever needs to make a decision to act on what you're saying, draw them to yourself tonight. And now, rather than us standing and singing, I'm going to ask Grant to come and with the instrumentalist just to sing through this brief invitation. I'm going to be down at the front. And I'll be here to receive you if you want to come. Maybe even to pray about something. But let's continue in an attitude of prayer with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Grant, you sing the invitation. word could you say that yeah i'm just curious uh did, did the lord say anything to anyone tonight maybe through a scripture or something that he's speaking to you about and he wants you to testify to it verbally to the church anything i hadn't planned to ask you this so 
Apparently, God's got something that he wants to say to us through what you want to share and need to share. Yes, ma'am. Oh, just moving. I'm sorry. Okay, anybody? Yes, sir. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good. Good. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, that's where it was. Wow. Wow. Amen. Would, would you read that verse for us? Just so, just to remind everybody what it says. That's great. Amen. Thank you, brother. That is a marvelous word. All right. Anyone else? 